from the grassroots, connecting people and sharing ideas. Hi, this is Arlene and you are listening to Durian ASEAN. Hi, this is Gauri. We are moving on to our Blast from the Grassroots session this morning. And today, of course, we have Maverick Fu, <laughs> who just uh, came in to talk about startups. Hey, how are you? Hi, good morning, ladies. I can't help to see, uh, to look at your t-shirt. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, okay, why don't I just repeat what's on my t-shirt then? Uh, so, it's called Asshole... <laughs> Okay, but this is asshole room number 32. 32. You uh, gotta be one, be the biggest in the room. Yes, correct. I guess you are the biggest in the room. <laughs> we are talking yeah, about. Yeah, as compared to ladies here. <laughs> yes. Uh, biggest in terms of doesn't necessarily in terms of size. Can be in terms of your, I don't know. <laughs> and it can be a real bitch sometimes. So, yes. Okay. So to start up today's topic is how not to build a startup. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and you are the co-founder of Kickstart Malaysia. Yes. Um, what is it all about, Kickstart Malaysia? Uh, okay, Kickstart is basically very much a grassroots entrepreneurial community. Uh, we meet once a month. It's kind of like a monthly meetup event where we bring speakers from around the region, sometimes internationally as well. Uh, and we put that on stage. So we make it like a little TED session. The only difference is that we put in Q&A because I think sometimes we... Uh, the speakers deserve some, uh, at least the audience deserves some uh, question and answers like how do they get started, you know, what are the uh, failures they've gone through before. Uh, and the key to a successful kickstart event is also the networking as well. Uh, we want to bring in basically 25 to 35 year old uh, next generation entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, if you're able to ask me why I started Kickstart, it's because, uh, okay, sorry, V and I have to quote you again. If you've been to any business networking international breakfast meetings, you will see entrepreneurs who most probably dress like your dads uh, showing up at 6.30 in the morning and they network. And I've been in business for 10 years and usually I don't see people wearing uh, you know, asshole t-shirts or jeans uh, going to a BNI event. So I say, you know what, there's obviously a gap. Like where do entrepreneurs, the younger ones like me, hang out? And when I look at the, you know, the scene in Singapore, almost every night there are startup events, uh, but I don't see that happening here uh, at least two years ago. Mm-hmm. So that's how we started Kickstart because we saw there was a void in the market. We see there are certain things we are not happy with whatever communities there are, and we decided to, you know what, just uh, just do something about it. How vibrant is the startup communities in Malaysia? Oh, now it's very. I mean, like thanks to Magic and the various initiatives uh, by the MOF, uh, I think in the last, at least the last 12 months itself, it has picked up tremendously. But when we started in July 2012, uh, uh, I don't know, I think the startup people, they are still hiding in their bad cave, plotting their world domination plans and all that. So they don't, they hardly come out. So one idea of Kickstart is to build a platform where these people can actually come out more often, so uh, then gain prominence. And interestingly, since then, we started noticing, uh, not that we created it, uh, we would say maybe we want a mini catalyst of it. Uh, we actually see more meetup and uh, other community you know, groups coming up after that, uh, which is great. So, yeah. You, you, you met a lot of people, you know, uh, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs who are just starting up. Yep. And you, I, I bet you have your fair share of failures and success as well when it yes. comes to startups. Very so much. what are the stories that you would like to tell in terms of those who aspire to build a startup but have yet to come to nowhere else in terms of achieving any success? Yet? Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. First, advice, first advice is just fucking do it already. Stop sitting there. You know, there are some people who come to me, hey, Math, I got this idea I've been thinking about for three years. Am I like, wow, you've been thinking, and how many people have you talked to me about? And they say, yeah, only my mom and my grandma. <laughs> and, and what like, your mom can do about it, right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, most parents. Okay, there are two kinds of parents generally. I'm, I'm a parent as well. So one you is like... You have a son, isn't it? Yeah, I have a son too. Yeah, so I, I'm like highly... Uh, some parents are highly encouraging. So whatever dumbass idea that the kids come to them, they say, hey, good lah, good lah, you know. But some are the more overprotective kind, which I think most Asian parents are. It's like, you know, why not you go and get a good job and, you know, don't Following don't the dream. traditional path, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like, for me, it took me, I had to drop out of college 
to convince my parents that I want to become an entrepreneur. It's like, you know what? Now that I don't have a degree, no one will hire me anymore. So you have to let me start my own business. So, uh, but you know, I, I mean, yeah. for for younger generation, especially in the time where... Rebellious. I'm talking about the economic condition, like, and then in a time where unemployment is something of a reality, mm-hmm. you, when you you join the work the workforce, there are there's a chance where you cannot get a job. Yeah. So. But that's in the so states, th- not here, right? Um, in, to some extent, some of unless the they are choosy generation. with the jobs, lah. <laughs> so, which I think there are problems with Malaysia. I I think seriously, yeah, because. My day job or my day business is a talent uh, development consultant for MNCs. I think seriously in Malaysia, it's actually an employee's market. You can actually get jobs. Uh, unless you are super picky, you can get a job. Go mm-hmm. work at Starbucks. If you are just, you know, there are some people who come to me and say, hey, Mav, the you know, employment market is so bad, I cannot find a job and stuff like that. Uh, I'm starving. Can I pin jumps and do it? Perhaps that's the justification yeah. of parents like, oh, we would want you to have a degree. At least you have something to fall back to. Yeah, good in luck case, with that. <laughs> in case so many unemployed degree holders, right? Yeah, but but what's your justification of you know dropping out and not following the traditional path of oh. getting a degree, regardless whatever degree it is? Okay, okay. Having said that, I dropped out not because my results were bad. I mean, mind you, my mom was a teacher, so I cannot afford to have bad. Uh, my CGPA was like three point five out of four, so. Uh, mine was very much a voluntary basis. Uh, you see, because somehow, like I'm good at maths, so I can basically, if one plus one somehow equals two, I see the equation of life. I see some people get their degrees, work, and they're not happy. You know, they're not happy with what they have and all that. And I started to wonder, the catalyst point was very much when my mom first got cancer. And when, I'm like, when she's at the bed and stuff like that, I'm like, wow. Uh, I mean, she worked hard all her life. The, my dad worked hard all his life as well. He owns a business and all that. And yet somehow this happened. And you know, uh, our savings are being drained away. You know, the, the family is put into turmoil. And there has to be another way. So somehow at that point, I thought money could solve the problem. And I realized it's not. It's actually freedom, but not financial freedom. A lot of people think that, hey, you know what? I want to be freaking rich until I don't have to work for a single day. Uh, 23-year-old me would say something like that, but nowadays it's more about a balanced living. If I don't want to stability, work today... Stability, is it? Uh, not just stability. It's like there's, well, balance in life. It's like if I want, I can go and watch my son's soccer game. Mm-hmm. I can basically just tell my client, you know, you know, it's a very important day for my kid. Can we meet next week? And my clients must be okay with that. Mm-hmm. To create that kind of well-balanced freedom, uh, I think it's something what the new generation entrepreneurs are striving at. They are not... Uh, they will say that they are not happy with their bosses and or their mm-hmm. pace and stuff like that. But I think deep down they are just desperate for that kind of freedom. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to uh, the workforce in Malaysia, yep. um, what do you see in them that you think they should get off of, get off of the box and see the world or something like that? Um, oh, first stop living with your parents. That's that's <laughs> one. Get off your parents' garage, please. And, uh, you know, just, okay, it depends. Find your passion. A lot of, okay, the, also another problem with Asian parenting in general is that if a kid shows that they have certain talents or certain passion in something, especially if like it's like art or music, the parents will really surprise, hey, you know, all the artists are like poor. I mean, they are rich artists for Christ's sake. So they suppress all those talents. And because of that, over 10 years of suppress depression, I guess, uh, they start to become rebellious and somehow they lost their clarity in life. So I think for the young ones is that, you know, go out and meet new people. Uh, make it an effort every week to meet at least, I don't know, five to ten new people and not don't just hang around the same friends like all the time. Uh, come to Kickstart or go to Incitement. There are so many communities that are free for you to just go out, keep an open mind and explore. So mm-hmm. maybe what you... Okay, this is failure tip number one. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people think that start, they want to start a business because they hate their job. But frankly, it could be because they just lose their passion in life. You can still f- be working for a boss and still you know, be passionate about your fishing trips or your travel and stuff like that. It's, it's actually a lot easier to have someone pay your salary every month so that you can actually save and travel. It doesn't mean that you need to become an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's one of the first thing that I find, they always find that entrepreneurship is an escape. It's not, it's a choice. Uh, if you think that you want to make a difference to the world through 
uh, entrepreneurship or commerce, then then try at least try once at, in your life. But don't look it as the only way to get out or of your suffering and to become happy. It's, it doesn't work like that. Take marijuana, it helps a lot better. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's also a matter of perception. Like you said mm. earlier, Malaysians are very picky with their job. Yes. And a lot of people have this thing where, oh, if you work at Starbucks or McDonald's, you're a failure in life. Oh, come on. Starbucks is a great organization. I applied for, to work for them so mm. many times and they rejected me. So I think at one point, I need to buy the whole McDonald's. You know, Starbucks is like, you know, please hire me. Uh, but, okay, the pay may or may not be good. But think about it. Uh, even in KL... But at the end of the day, it's about the pay, isn't it? When it comes to employees. No, not really. I think it's also job satisfaction. The reason why I recommend Starbucks is because they have great work culture. Because you go there, okay, you meet people. Every time when you're ser- a barista is serving you the drink, they'll start to, they'll try to have a conversation with you. If you are in the barista's conversa- uh, you know, position, you can have conversations with random people all the time. You know what? That builds confidence. Just go for like three or six months you know, to work there. And it's flexible hours as well. It's really easy job if you ask me. I mean, how wrong can you get mixing automated coffee? La? Frankly, Starbucks coffee doesn't even taste that great because it's, you know, it's not really hard to make. But it's actually the culture that, that attracts people like me to go there. Wait, yeah. Glad that you mentioned culture. So what what kind of culture people should not adopt when building a startup? Oh, when it comes uh, greedy, it's like selfish. My app, my idea is going to beat mm-hmm. Facebook, and you know they don't hide, uh, it, they don't share. I think, frankly, a lot of people think that their idea is original. It's not. Mm-hmm. There's actually no original idea since the toilet bowl. I think. You know, or, or the toilet roll. Even Steve Paper Jobs' clip. idea of iPad. Or it's innovation. iPod. It's not. It's just improvisation from the past. Yeah. Products. It, yeah, it's basically just seeing something that doesn't work. Like you see a gasoline car, it did not. It didn't work. So make an electric car. So it's not really something new, new per se. You did not invent the wheel or the car. You're just making a better car. So the only way to make something better is to get feedback. So you go and tell your friends and selected friends. Don't tell you know those friends who always bitch and moan and complain. But tell your ideas to entrepreneurs. Like, okay, I have this idea. This is how I'm going to make money. This is how we're going to get our first customer, blah, blah, blah. And let them validate the idea. Frankly, you have stole the idea from someone else anyway. The idea is not original. So why are you afraid of someone stealing your idea, right? Mm-hmm. And frankly, if someone actually did steal your idea... Uh, it's your fault. You did not move fast enough. You did not uh, pick up the pace. You did not do it. But having said that, uh, there's something called market sophistication. So even though someone steals your idea and do it first, you just need to reposition yourself and enter the market in another position. So mm-hmm. it's actually, so there's actually no harm to share your ideas. You know, just go ahead. Uh, a lot of people think that you cannot start, you cannot be an entrepreneur unless mm-hmm. you come from a very rich family. You need yeah, to have a large know. amount of savings. So what what do you say to that? Are you from a rich family? (laughs) No, I'm not. I'm not. Just be clear. (laughs) No, both my parents used... I mean, I'm from Kota Baru, so Mm. Kelantan. So my parents used to tell me a time where they can only spend like five ringgit Mm. on a meal for both of Mm -hmm. them, including myself. That was kind of poor. So... But it's also romantic, right? Yeah, romantic. Yeah, romantic is one. But, you know, so we... But my dad sort of brought... uh, You know, because he started to start his own business, Mm. self-employed and all that. So we became a bit better, but... Having said that, the only thing my parents gave me when I started my business was education. So my ability to speak English and mathematics, that has helped me tremendously. I don't have a lot of money. Uh, if you think that you need money to start business, you're already wrong. So you need contacts, you need network, you need uh, maybe an idea, an execution plan. And with all the grants happening in like Malaysia and stuff, like that, it's, it's kind of easy to get money to start a business. And I'm glad that you mentioned education. Mm. So you're not against education. No, you're I'm not. just against the exam oriented system. Certifications. Oh, certification. I, I hate, you know, if like you are studying cramping just mm. to score A or something, it's it doesn't make sense because life doesn't give you a score of A. Uh, until maybe if you die you go up and meet God and God give you an A then okay lah. But until that day comes, uh, you never know. So try your best and uh, but having said that like for my son, uh, there are a lot of top subjects that he can be good at, but there are two that I stress that he must be good at is communication, so language, and uh, mathematics. Not because so they can count money better, it's because mathematics does help you, it train you on problem solving. 
mm-hmm. yeah, which is essential as an entrepreneur. You need to you know, be trained to how to solve problems. That's mm-hmm. how you make money. So you emphasize more on the practical knowledge. Yeah, life knowledge. It's like negotiation skills. Like my mm-hmm. son will come to me and say, hey, if I take three broccolis today, can mm-hmm. I get a candy in the end? Then we start negotiating. Okay, why not five broccolis and half a candy? Mm-hmm. So at, at the age of four. So mm-hmm. which is... And sometimes I think kids are the best ways where you can learn if parents can just let down the ego. Ego is one reason why the education system is so, so cock up nowadays because we think that we get straight A's. I mean, we have friends who... So we are entitled. Yeah, it? bullshit. It's like, yeah, you get like, what, 24 A's and mm-hmm. then you're supposed to be set for life. Come on, you still have to <laughs> work hard, right? You know, it's so the education is just... Okay, the best metaphor for the freaking education system oh. today, not the whole world, not just Malaysia, is that... At the beginning of the year, all the animals of the jungle show up to the principal. You know, so there's elephants, there's hippos and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And the principal say, okay, you know what? For this year, the passing mark is climbing a tree. Mm-hmm. So monkey is like, all right, I score. The goldfish is like, I'm fucked already. It's mm-hmm. like, no matter what I do, I cannot mm-hmm. climb a tree. Then the elephant asks, can I like topple down the tree and climb it? No, you can't. You have to climb the tree. So ele- the elephant is equally fucked as well. So I think, what if... No, if my son is a monkey in this case, which is great because he can score, mm. but what if he's the goldfish or the frog? He will never be able to scale the tree because he's good at other things. And I think the problem with education is that you don't, they don't let you explore the things that are outside mm-hmm. of what is supposed to be main, mainstream. Like mm-hmm. art, I've seen kids who are very good at arts, but they're just, you know, you have to study science to be in the science stream, which is... You know, it just doesn't make sense. Why are you not developing a child's talent and you're actually forcing them to fit in a box? You know, mm. That's the reason why they're rebellious. That's why they're taking drugs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, parents wake up. <laughs> I, th- I, th- I actually went through something similar like that because... What, take drugs? <laughs> no, <laughs> I was in school. I was uh, in science stream. Yep. But actually from a very young age, I knew I kind of knew where my life was going. I wanted to be a Good. writer or something. Yeah. But my parents were like, no, you're going to fail. Yeah, you, you need, need to, you need to do something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And well, eventually, like you said, I, I did rebel against them because I knew that it's now or never. You know, if one, once I pick this thing in university, this is what I'm going to be doing. But you know what? I think somehow the, uh, the parents are in a conspiracy, mm. conspiracy to do that. It's like if I suppress my child more and they push back harder, they become more rebellious and they actually pursue their passion more. Maybe they'll become more successful. So I don't want to bash parents you know, <laughs> throughout this show, but I think somehow they just want the best out of them. And sometimes if it means caring over caring mm-hmm. for them I think that's what parents do but I think it's also like an awareness thing because when yeah. I told my parents I wanted to do performing arts they were just like what is that yeah. like no that's your first pitch <laughs> it's like when you yeah. as an entrepreneur you need to pitch all the time the first person you need right. to pitch to is your parents. your parents and I think your parents are basically giving you feedback it's like no like, I think you cannot mm. you know you know basically you can't make money so th- you you're supposed to like go back do some research and go back to mommy and daddy mm. and say you know what Justin Bieber went on YouTube, <laughs> record his <laughs> songs, and guess what? He's like a multi-gazillionaire right now. So then you basically forced to do more research and don't give up on mm-hmm. your dream. You know, so so I think parents are doing the right thing unconsciously. So yeah. What about all these uh, wealth creation books in the market, like Robert Kiyosaki and Donald uh, Trump? Have you read any of those? Are yeah, they are they helpful? Uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad was one of the first books mm. that you know because I come from Kota Baru, right? right? The only books that they have there are like. STPM books they mm-hmm. don't have like Tony Robbins and mm-hmm. stuff like that so when I came to KL I was certain it's like the katak bawah tempurung like, it's really like for the first time I see books like Seven Habits right. and How to Stephen Win Covey, yeah, right? uh, Dale Carnegie mm-hmm. and it at first it scares me overwhelms me but it actually forces me that shit there's actually a lot more things that I don't know that I need to meet a lot more people mm-hmm. because there's only so many books I can read in my life. Why not I outsource reading to people and they actually tell me the best parts of the books. So, uh, yes, books like Robert, uh, you know, by Robert Kiyosaki, mm-hmm. it helps. Uh, but having said that, a lot of people, after reading the book, they think, you know what, I need to buy, start buying properties. I need to start buying <gasps> shares. But they miss out the education part of it. I think what Robert mm-hmm. Kiyosaki is trying to say is that you need to get financially literate. Mm-hmm. So if you think that you want to go into the real estate market, do some research, you know, study, get a mentor, blah, blah, blah. Don't just get a $1 million loan and start buying condos and then just see it, you know, go to dust or something and you fail. 
Yeah, that's why entrepreneurs feel they don't do enough due diligence. They just look at Steve Jobs or Bill mm-hmm. Gates or Mark Zuckerberg and think that it's cool. They don't look at the hardship that all these people go through uh, to get to where they are. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they're not prepared to do that. I want to mention about all these startups, what I notice in common with with all with most of them, those successful ones, mm-hmm. they have angel investors. So how can people get angel investors in Malaysia network it's basically just go out like there's so many pitch fests uh, happening all around just basically go out pitch your idea you may or may not win the idea okay if you look at American Idol chances are the Mm. winner hardly become really really successful like Chris Daughtry is one of the I think Mm. he came in like second runner up but I always view him as one of the more successful ones hey he didn't win the competition but he used that as a platform Mm. so I think those want to be entrepreneurs or if you think you want to become an entrepreneur just go for a platform and start pitching you never know who's in the crowd that will invest in you so it's not about winning the competition it's about leveraging the opportunity no it's about being there it's i think 80 percent 18 percent of success is just show up i think the reason why most of us uh, sometimes malaysians i think they tend to be a bit complacent they think that uh, it's like looking for an ideal dream husband I can just wait at the bus stop and then the bus will come and Prince Charming will come down from the bus. Hey, what if Indra Kota or what if Putra mm. decided to change the bus route and you didn't get the memo? So you stand mm. up, you know, you end up waiting there for three hours for a bus that's not going to come. So I think as an entrepreneur, the first thing you need to do is run after a bus. Mm-hmm. So some people then ask me, okay, what if I run on the bus and my dream girl or my dream guy mm. is not there? Then get off the fucking bus, you know. <laughs> you just get off or you can hijack the bus mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But it's always about trying. I think sitting there at the bus stand and is not going to get you. the person then you wait, stumble like, upon you. Yeah. So it's if, not going to happen? It's not, it's not. So basically you go to every pitch competition there is, any hackathons, any... Any community platform, just go there, tell your ideas, share it. Sometimes it's a power connection. They talk about the sixth degree of separation. Mm -hmm. Who knows, just by meeting the seventh person, you get connected to your angel or Obama Mm -hmm. or Najib. So that will invest in your idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And I think a lesson for most entrepreneurs is that they always go in thinking that the angel investors always want ROI or money. Uh, necessary, isn't it? No. Actually, most of that, they don't even look... Yes, of course, they want to make money out of the investment. But they actually want to look at your idea and they want to look at you. Uh, mm-hmm. What's the reason you're doing this? What's the social impact? What's the difference that you can make for the world? And mm-hmm. whether you're passionate enough. Mm-hmm. So, if you, there's something that entrepreneurs need to learn is how, how to articulate their their business plan. Even a three-year-old will understand what they're trying to do. Yeah. And uh, the last one, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, when mm-hmm. it comes to business, uh, it's easier to have a great idea, to have a great angel mm-hmm. investor, and then to move up uh, and, and to be successful in the startup, but to maintain the startup uh. into something larger or at least to maintain it yep. uh, to be as successful in, in the next 10 years' time. What not to do? Like, if there's an, one advice not to do in terms of maintaining I don't know maybe don't overdo it uh, okay there are some people like even I okay when you start the business you're at the initial stage so you start and stuff like that you're talking about basically the sustenance and then expansion like sustenance I'm pretty okay with it that's what I've been doing but expansion frankly is one area that I'm I know I'm weak at as well I need partners I need basically people I need to hire people and stuff like that so I think to be always manage cash flow you will th- Okay, basically, I've seen this happen like a million times. Uh, Your business is doing well. Angel investor comes in with like a million dollars. They start spending like shit. They they hire people not being careful. They stop being careful. So that's where money start going up. They think they have money in the bank, but actually they don't. So it's all about cash flow management as well. Uh, Simple thing. uh, I mean, there are simple examples as well where a great idea got funded, 500,000 and blah, 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 stuff like that. Uh, sometimes the first thing they do is to hire an accountant, which I'm like, what, what the hell do you need to hire an accountant for to, what, to count the 500000 that's depleting every month? No, you should hire someone like uh, a marketing person or a salesperson, someone that, or business development. So somehow, sometimes when money is too much, they get dumb. Mm-hmm. They start, you know, okay, a typical example many years ago is between DG and Cellcom. 
I used to remember this Cellcom ad where a girl walks out in New York, a New York cab, raining, she takes her umbrella, she walks on the street like Broadwalk and blah, blah, blah. For like two minutes, I'm like, okay, what the heck is they trying to do? So, oh, they're trying to say about, say, international roaming. But it's like, wow, two minutes, just just watch this girl in the umbrella. It, it doesn't even make sense. But DG at that time was, I wouldn't say they're struggling, but they have a very limited Fun. Uh, um, marketing budget, right? So they basically just play rock, paper, scissors, and stone and say, you know what, you lose, you dress up in the yellow outfit and you go and dance around or become and do the I will follow you or, you know. Mm. But that's how they became successful because when they have less money, they actually think, out of the box and I've seen countless companies do things like that when they don't have a lot of money they actually become more resourceful like I mean, you can see with Nando's compared to other big yeah. brands in comes to fast food yeah they are very fast they are very innovative they know I think when yeah. you have lesser money you become uh, smarter I'm not saying not to have money but I don't know maybe when you get some funding go and buy a sport car first so at the end of the day when you fail the business at least you have a sport car right <laughs> so, yeah. so that's all we have today I Excellent. think we have we will have more conversation next time if we invite you yes parenting <laughs> so thank you very thank much thank you so much for joining us in the studio this thank morning you,